You know, every fifth Sunday, we, we have our kids join us um, here in worship um, to experience being a part of the body of Christ together as we, as we sing praises to God, as we um, take communion, as we uh, share in the offering, as we hear preaching, um, so that they can know what it's like to be uh, a part of the body of Christ, the bigger body of Christ. And so we welcome you all here today. You know, when I was a kid, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, where it was really hot in the summertime. And I don't know what your, your summer fun things are, but as a kid, I used to go, I, I spent most of my days outside in the summer, riding my bike, going down to the community pool, um, playing uh, basketball and baseball, uh, running in the sprinklers. And, you know, as a kid, we didn't have these fancy plastic water bottles. Um, certainly did not have a Yeti mug that kept our water cool. So you know what we did? We went over to the garden hose, which I know you're not supposed to do. And you would hope that you weren't the first kid in line because then you would have to pucker up to make sure you didn't have this warm, non-refreshing water coming into your mouth. And you know, it's, it's a lot like that. It's been really warm this past week, and my, my lawn was turning brown, and the flowers were fading and wilting. And then something amazing happened at the beginning of this week. Maybe you guys experienced it, where God sent that rain in the morning that came down, and it was just so refreshing to my body. And I looked out, and the, the grass has come green again, and the flowers have started turning their colors again. And it's a lot like that in our spiritual lives, that we can be so busy, and we can be so worried about the things of today that we miss out on time with God, the one who refreshes our soul and our life. And that's what we're here for today. And King David wrote about this in Psalms. In Psalm 63, he said this, O God, you are my God, and earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and a weary land where there is no water. And so I looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory, because your steadfast love is greater than life. My lips will praise you, and I will bless you as long as I live and lift my, names, lift my hands in your name. Would you guys stand with me as we start our service right now? And would you do this? Would you just right there where you're at, would you just recognize that you are in the presence of God who is our Father and the creator and the sustainer of each of us and of every living thing? And would you just tell him right there where you're at? Tell him that you love him. Thank him for what he's done in your life, in your family. And as we start today, just know that we were here together as God's people, giving praise to him. My dead heart now is beating, my deep 
death has lost its sting from the grave you've risen victoriously into marvelous light I'm running out of darkness out of shame by the cross you are the truth you are the light you are the way into marvelous light I'm running out of darkness out of shame by the cross you my hands and spin around see the light that i have found oh the marvelous light marvelous light lift my hands and spin around see the light that i have found oh the marvelous light marvelous light its power, death has lost its sting, from the grave you've risen, victoriously, into marvelous light I'm run, out of darkness, out of shame, by the cross you are the truth, you are the light, you are the way.
is Jesse Poole, and I get the pleasure and honor of being the children's pastor here at CCF. And today, I'm just thankful for the opportunity to get to lead us in communion. And as I was going through this week, I was I was thinking, I was just trying to figure out what 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 am what am I going to talk about today? What 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 is what what am I being led to with the children being in service with us with us today? You know, we have our kindergartners through all the other kids with us today. Anyone that's not in their kindergarten is back there in service and. I just thought it was so important that we just focus on the origin of communion, that we focus on just the beginning of communion. So today I'm going to be referencing some scripture in Matthew, Matthew chapter 26, and I'm going to be going through verses 17 through 28. But for our kids out there, if you're, if you're sitting out there, you're wondering, what is communion? Communion is one of the ordinances that God gave us along with baptism. And it happens the night before Jesus' crucifixion that they have the Last Supper. So we're going to go through these verses, and we're just going to take a recap on the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples. We'll start with verse 17. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to prepare the Passover so you may eat it? Go into the city to a certain man, he said, and tell him, the teacher says, my time is near. I am celebrating the Passover at your place with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, he was reclining at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, I assure you, one of you will betray me. Deeply distressed, each one began to say to him, surely not I, Lord. He replied, the one who dipped his hand with me in the bowl, he will betray me. The son of man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, his betrayer, replied, surely not I, Rabbi. You have said it, he told him. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread. He blessed it and he broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat it. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood that establishes the covenant. It is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I tell you, from this moment I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it in a new way in my Father's kingdom with you. So we see in this passage where Jesus indicated to his disciples about the Last Supper, about the resemblance of breaking the bread as his body was broken and drinking the wine as a resemblance of the atonement of our sins and the blood that was spilled. So as we're going to this next song before we get the elements for our communion, we should just take a moment to reflect on the fact that Jesus sacrificed his life, the breaking of his body, the shedding of his blood for our sins. So we're going to take a moment for prayer and then we'll go into our next song. God, thank you for today. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the commitment of sacrifice for us. We know that you were beaten and that you were bruised and that your body was broken. And we know that your blood was spilled as an atonement for us, God. Individuals who don't deserve it, but you did it for us. We love you, we trust you, and thank you for everything. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.
church, you should have all received your elements. And as we see in Luke, in the uh, reference of scripture, Jesus grabs the bread, gives his thanks, hands it to the disciples, and he says, do this in remembrance of me. You may take your bread. And then the same with the cup. He grabs the cup, tells him, this is a new covenant of my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. You may take your cup. And now, if you all join me in saying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, thou art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Are we good? Are we coming on live now? Awesome. So I'm Chad Wraith. I get to serve here at CCF in various teaching and preaching capacities every now and then. Uh, so it's an honor to be with you. I love getting to be able to proclaim God's word to God's people. This is a real joy for me um, and hopefully a little bit of a break for Pastor Pat at the same time to get to be able to be up here and preach. Now, something unique about this morning is where I'm actually going to preach on an entire book of the Bible. Uh, which we rarely go through an entire book in one sermon. And you're, if you have kids out there, you're especially nervous right now uh, because you're like, how are we going to pull this off, man? I mean, my kids just spilled Jesus all over themselves and, you know, with the Lord's Supper. I'm, literally, ours did, so um, up here. So um, we're, it's a small book of the Bible, though, so don't worry. It's only 13 verses. And, in fact, we're going to read through the entire letter. It's actually Second John, the uh, entire letter uh, for our beginning Scripture reading. And then I'm going to unpack the letter in three parts. I'm going to deal with the very beginning, uh, part one, dealing with some of the the kind of meaty concepts that are there at the introduction. And then I'm going to move on to part two, and I'm going to look at this interplay that John does between truth and love and talk a little bit about that interplay. And then we're going to conclude by looking at the particular Christological heresy that John was dealing with at the time, the particular problem with how people were thinking about Jesus and the community in which he wrote, and why that controversy is actually applicable for us today in a particular way. And that's how I want to end the sermon. So those will be the three parts. So to begin with, if you'll join me, let's stand, and I'm going to read the entire letter of Second John. Again, it's only 13 verses, um, and some of those verses are not even very long. So we'll be able to get through this. Even my own children can handle this. Second John. The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us. From God the Father not Father God, God the Father, and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. 
And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teachings of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching of both the Father and the Son, if, uh, whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive them into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked deeds. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face, so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greets you. The word of the Lord. Have a seat. So right here at the beginning of John, again, I'm going to deal with this in three parts, so let's look at the very beginning. John manages in one sentence to pack several big, juicy theological concepts of the Christian faith, and this is found in verse 3. This is probably one of the more theologically thick sentences in the entire New Testament because of the concepts and the terms that it contains all jam-packed into one line. And quite frankly, each of these terms and concepts, I could spend an entire sermon unpacking because they're so important and so vital to what it means to live the Christian faith. So look at verse 3. Grace, mercy, peace be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. Those concepts, grace, mercy, peace, truth, love. These concepts are the DNA of what it means to live out the Christian faith. When we talk about grace, we're talking about God's positive disposition towards you that changes you. I think this is the changing you part is very important to stress because God does not look favorably upon anyone and that person remain the same. When God looks favorably upon you, it is intrinsically a transformative look. And that grace is ours. Mercy, not getting what you deserve, but compassion and relief instead The uh, underlying Greek word of that appears many times in the New Testament, eleon, but you you may remember it as uh, eleison, which is a kind of derivative, and every time I hear that word, I cannot help but think of the Mr. Mr. song from 1986 that was the number one hit for two weeks, Curie eleison. Do you remember that? Curie eleison on the road that we will travel, Curie eleison. That's actually a Greek phrase meaning, Lord, have mercy. And it is taken from part of the liturgical uh, confessions that go on within the church during the confession of sin. You may have been a part, for example, of a Catholic mass or maybe part of an uh, Anglican service before. And sometimes in the middle of the confession of sin, they'll say, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy after confessing sin. It's an intrinsic part of what it means to relate to God is mercy. Peace. This is not just a, a, a lack of conflict, a state of a lack of conflict. Peace is understood as a state of well-being, an existence of wholeness. Sometimes the even Hebrew word captures this better, shalom. It's the understanding of wellness or wholeness that is upon us. Truth, the mind's conformity to what is to what actually exists, to what is real. 
In the New Testament, there is no such concept as my truth. There is simply what is true, and you are called to conform to it. If you add the word to, if, you, if you have to add the word my to truth, you're now in the realm of opinion. Love, the will's attachment to what is good that results in the promotion of the good. And this will be a key part of John's way of thinking about love. Love is not a feeling. Love is an attachment to the good that results in your promotion of that thing that is good. So there's an active component, an action component that always coexists with the notion of love. If you love something, you'll do something about it. There's that correlation between the two. So these concepts, these ideas, this is the ethos that is Christianity. Grace, mercy, peace, love, truth. These concepts should roll off of your tongue and be on your mind constantly as a Christian. Of course, with the greatest of these being love. And that leads us to the second part of the sermon. In the rest of John's letter, as with his other writings, there is a special interplay that goes on between love and truth. Listen to what he writes in 1 John, for example. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Love in truth. 2 John He writes in verse 4, I greatly rejoiced to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments, which are true. Now, to unpack this interplay between truth and love, I'm going to draw from Augustine again, St. Augustine. And I drew from him in my last sermon. And the joy of not preaching very often is I get to say just about the same thing I always say every time I preach, and you forget. And then it sounds like I'm saying something new again. But in fact, if you were to listen to my sermons, it's basically the same thing over and over again. Love God with all your heart, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And we're just looking at that in various ways. We can look at it through the work of Christ. We can look at it through the commandments. We can look at it through particular controversies. But at the end of the day, every sermon is about the main thing. And according to the main thing, according to Jesus, the main thing is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And everything just flows from that in every sermon. So here we go again. I'm going to talk about love once again. And I'm going to particularly draw on Augustine in this particular quote that has meant a lot to me and helped shape my own understanding of the interplay between faith, um, sorry, between truth and love. The interplay between truth and love. And that quote is this. You cannot love what you do not know. And you cannot know what you do not love. And I'm going to unpack each part of that in this second part of the sermon. You cannot love what you do not know. I think we intrinsically understand this. For example, if I said to you, do you love that person? And that's all I said. Do you love that person? Naturally, What's going to be your next question? Which person? Because you don't love that person. That doesn't mean anything to you. Because it needs to be filled in a little bit with particulars. Knowledge. You need to give me some more information. You need to give me some more truth before I can tell you if I love it. So then if I said, you said that, which person? And I said, that girl. Your next question would be, which girl? Now, I know this sounds stupid, but go with me here. And then if, I, if, you, if you said, which girl? And I said, the girl who drives a car. You would still not be able to answer the question of whether or not you love this person yet. Right? Because it's still too generic. Our loves are always directed at something particular And that particular thing contains things we know about it to give it its particularity. 
I have to tell you more. And you said, which car, right? We'd go on and on until the details were there so that you could say whether or not you loved this person or not. Because you cannot love what you do not know. This is the same way in religion. You cannot love God. You cannot love generically a deity. The word God is just the, you know, kind of English translation of, you know, the Latin word deus, which is the translation of the Greek word theos. It's a generic term. It doesn't mean Christian at all. I mean, the Romans had theos. I mean, the Greeks had theos. I mean, Christian, God, the word God is a generic term for deity, for the deity. Just like you can't love human, you can't love generically human, you love particular humans, you can't love God. That notion of God has to be filled out in particulars for you as a human to actually have a loving relationship with it. You cannot love and relate to theos. It must be defined more specifically if you're actually going to be able to truly have love for this thing and not a fleeting maybe affection or maybe some sort of sentimental good thoughts. If you're actually going to have a love relationship, which is one of commitment, which is one of attachment, one of attainment, it must be filled in in particulars. And this is where Truth comes in in the Christian faith. Theology, the deep study of God, wrestling with Scripture, spending time in contemplation, meditation in prayer, wrestling with the deep truths of the Christian faith. This is all part of getting to know the particulars of this deity and thus enabling us to actually love this deity. The doctrine of the Trinity, for example, the notion that God is one in substance, three in persons, one ousia, three hypostasis. This is not some abstract, mysterious, unintelligible theological doctrine left to the confines, monks and nuns, and Chad Rafe to think about. This is about, the doctrine of the Trinity, for example, is about knowing and articulating a level of particularity to this Godhead that enables you to actually love it and relate to it. And in fact, this is exactly why the incarnation of Jesus is so vital within the Christian faith because it is with the incarnation that we have the fullness of God's revelation of himself in the person and work of Christ. You cannot love God unless you know the particulars of this God. It's not love what you have. It could be a fleeting affection, a good feeling, a nice therapeutic deity there to make you feel better about your life or to give you a parking spot in the grocery store when you pray for it. But it's not love that you have unless you know this God that you claim to love. And the only way you're going to get to know this God that you claim to love is to pursue with all your heart truth that you can with the capacities that God has given you. So all the available knowledge is there through revelation, through Scripture, through the history of the church, thinking and unpacking the revelation of Christ in Scripture. It's all there. It's in front of you to pursue and obtain and contemplate and unpack. And all of that will lead to a deeper love. But this gets to the next part of Augustine's quote. You cannot know what you do not love. You know you love something when you structure your life to pursue it. 
whether it's a hobby, whether it's a person, whether it's some goal that you have for your life, you know you love something whenever you see your life being structured around pursuing it. Part of the problem of us not going deeper and pursuing more deeply the truths of the Christian faith is because the spark of love may actually not be there propelling us. Maybe Christianity is just a convenient add-on to your life, and you just need to be soberly aware of that. That Christianity is a convenient add-on, especially in Salem Springs, that you come on Sunday, maybe do nice things during the week, and that's the extent of your Christian faith. That might be the case. It's very easy for it to be the case in our culture. What you have to ask yourself is how is your life actually structured? Because that will show you where your loves are. Don't ask yourself if you love God. Ask how your life is structured. And that will tell you if you love God. The way it's formed, the way your thoughts are formed, the way you structure your day, what's your liturgy for your day, what do you pursue, what are you interested in. And that love has to be there for you to actually care about pursuing God in truth, theologically. And I'll give you an own example of my own theological education, to be quite honest. And I am, granted, a little bit of an extreme case. I always have been. But this, you know, for me, when I, some of you may know this, when I became a Christian, I was 21 years old, and I was almost finished at Georgia Tech as an industrial and systems engineer, and I was doing quite well there. I graduated quite well there and had a very successful career ahead of me in engineering. When I became a Christian, it so transformed me in a way that I can't even hardly explain sometimes. When I graduated from Georgia Tech, my love for God, my just pursuit of these things, my desire to pursue them, led me to divert from this very successful, particularly lucrative path of engineering, and I went to seminary. And I got my master's in divinity at that point, three and a half years of studying. At that point, I was also offered another engineering job. I wasn't convinced I wasn't going back to engineering at that point. But the love I had for these things, quite frankly, the love I have for God in Christ compelled me. I wanted to know more. Because for me, when I sat in class, it was a thrill. As my professors would unpack theology and talk about Scripture, and, and we were dealing with ethics, and we were dealing with moral philosophy and things, it ain't for everyone, but it was for me, because I felt like I was getting to know this God that had so transformed my life. Then I went on, and I did another degree, Master's of Theology. This time I was dragging along my wife with me at the time. She was wrapped up in this mess. And I did two and a half years of study there in Vancouver, British Columbia, out of love, out of pursuit of God. Next thing I know, four and a half years of doing a PhD in theology then teaching theology the rest of my career. Why? I can stand here before you and said, the reason was I loved God. And to this day, I preach because I love God. I love God in Christ. I love this. And I love talking about him. And I love learning about him. And for some of you that you're not called to this in the same way I am, but you're called to love God, which means you're called to be a theologian. You're called to be a thinker. You're called to pursue truth. And you're called in that inner relationship between truth and love. Now, the last part of the sermon. I'm going to apply what well, John does, but, so I will, apply this interplay between truth and love to a particular theological problem that was taking place within the church at the time. And I want to just set up this last part, John's writing into the, this particular controversy saying, by saying this, if there's a reciprocal relationship between truth and love, then improper thinking leads to improper and misdirected loves. There is a deep interplay between what you think and how you love. What you think is true will shape and guide how you pursue your loves and, in fact, where your loves are directed and engaged. And if you have improper thoughts about anything, it'll lead to improper structure of your life around that thing. 
And it's equally true when it comes to Christianity, God, and Christ. If you have improper thoughts about Jesus, it's going to lead to an improper structuring of your Christian journey. And it'll lead to an improper direction of your loves and your affections. And so wrong thoughts about God, especially what God has done in Christ, leads to misdirected pursuits, loves, and actions as a Christian. So John is very concerned that the community in which he writes thinks right thoughts about Christ so they have right loves as a Christian and right pursuits as a Christian. Let me say it again. If you have bad theology, you're going to have a bad structured life and pursuits. Those two go hand in hand because of the inner relationship between truth and love. What we have here that John is addressing, which is quite relevant to us today, is a notion of uh, syncretism that was taking place in the church in which he wrote. What do I mean by syncretism? The whole idea of syncretism is allowing a foreign worldview to propel your life and you then fit Christianity into that foreign worldview. I'm going to be very clear about this. What drives and shapes your approach to life is something other than the Christian worldview as your primary driver, and then you fit Christianity to be in harmony with that primary worldview that is not Christian worldview. So, for example, in the church in which he writes, we all know this, Pat's mentioned it a number of times, he's dealing with Gnosticism. There's a particular way in which a Gnostic thought, generally speaking, having nothing to do with Christianity, had a particular devaluation of materiality and the embodiment of the human person. They were very much into the mind, the immaterial, and the enlightenment that comes from the acquisition of, quote, hidden knowledge and truth. Okay, that's generally in Gnosticism. So what took place in John's church is that Gnostics, people that embraced a Gnostic thought primarily, became Christians. But they remain primarily Gnostics. And then fitted Christianity to be in harmony with Gnosticism. And John says, no, 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 no. Now you've got a false religion. You've got a Christianized Gnosticism that is not a true Christian approach to the world and a Christian approach to Christ in particular. There is absolutely nothing wrong with Christians borrowing anything that is true, good, and beautiful in the world, wherever it's found, by whatever religion, by whatever scientific discovery. There is nothing at all wrong, and Christians have done this in the entire history of the Christian faith, borrowed, taken, applied, incorporated truth and goodness and beauty Anywhere it can be found because of the fundamental belief that the author of all things true, good, and beautiful is the same God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as creator, sustainer, and redeemer of all things. So Christians, it don't matter if it's Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam. It doesn't matter if it's chemistry, psychology, sociology. It doesn't matter. If it's true wherever it's found, it can be borrowed and incorporated and included to deepen, enrich, enlarge the Christian faith. And we embrace that because we don't believe that there's a conflict between truth and truth. All truth comes from God and returns to God for His praise and glory. But there's a difference between appropriating things that are true, good, and beautiful in the world and deepening the Christian faith and allowing a worldview that's not Christian to dominate the approach, and you then insert Christianity and conform it to that worldview. That's syncretism. And we find it happening, I think, all around us right now. I mean, especially in election year. I honestly feel like sometimes we have an American patriotism perspective of this country that people fit Christianity conveniently into. Kind of Americana Christiana. 
that takes place. I mean, people, you, people may be veterans. Our passion and pride for this country may be strong. And I find nothing wrong with that. Where sacrifices and service has been done, and there is absolutely nothing wrong and should be rightfully admired for those sacrifices. But even so, Jesus calls us to a different allegiance. I mean, in fact, he says of attachments so much deeper than your identity of, of the nation. I mean, he says with parents, unless you hate your father and mother, you cannot follow me as a way of a wake-up call to where the first allegiance has to be. So we have to be careful that our understanding of Americanism isn't the primary driver of our approach to the world, and we're conveniently, and this is what I see by certain preachers and prophets and all this kind of stuff, we conveniently fit Christianity in what is driving our worldview, which is a certain American patriotism. We got to be careful, especially in election year, of where our first driver is, and it must be the Christian faith. I also find this with a lot of, I mean, we're all tempted to this, prosperity understanding of Christian faith. We all buy into a certain understanding of what success means in this country, and success means in our particular worlds in which we live, especially here in America, but especially, you know, where we live and maybe in corporate America. We have an understanding of what success is, what prosperity is, and then we conveniently fit scriptures and conveniently, script, uh, not conveniently, maybe it's hard sometimes, but we fit the Christian worldview into a presupposed understanding of success in America, and now we've got syncretism. Because the success measures in America in terms of prosperity is not Jesus' success measures. You can't find that. The same success measures in the Gospels. And so we have to be careful in our temptations that the first foot forward that's driving our perspective of the world isn't an actual worldly understanding of success into which we're conveniently fitting our Christianity. I find this to be true also of progressivism. That there's a particular progressive understanding of the human person, whether it be gender issues or sexuality or abortion, whatever it may be, that I find in certain circles that it is a very progressive understanding of the human person into which Christianity is then shaped and molded and conveniently fit, leading to a Christianity that doesn't seem to be the one proclaimed by Christ. We're all tempted to do this, all of us. It's hard because we swim in worldviews that aren't Christian even in Siloam Springs. And we have to do the hard work of thinking and wrestling, contemplating, theological study, all of us, in order that we can be assured that we're not living a synchristic life like the Christians in John's writing, but are instead actually allowing the framework of Christianity to drive us inform us as we appropriate truths wherever they may be found all around us. I'm going to end where I began. Grace, mercy, peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and in love. Amen. I'll pray. We are so grateful, Father, that before we ever loved you, you first loved us and demonstrated the depth of your love and in your own person in the incarnation, life, death, resurrection, and ascension of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and mercy and peace be with us. May we cultivate truth and love together and be a people that demonstrate in the world 
Christ has come. Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Amen. Pastor here at CCF. Thank you for all those who are watching online. We so appreciate you being here with us this morning. At this time, we're going to go ahead and begin our offering. So I'm going to ask the ushers to go ahead and come forward. Um, just a little bit about um, the ministry that I work with. Um, I am very proud to be the student pastor here at CCF, to be able to see many of our students, just like you guys sitting up right here, um, consistently on a Wednesday night and Sunday mornings and, you know, just throughout our community. And we, I just want you all to know, we have incredible students. They are happy. They are excited to learn more and go deeper. And they really just are a shining light and a great example to even me as I continue to serve here, um, to continue to follow Jesus. So it's because of you guys that, you know, you guys set the example for us in our community. I'm just so proud of you guys. So um, while the ushers are passing um, the offering bags, feel free to text to give or to give in the bag as they are passed. Um, and as you are doing that, we got some announcements for you guys. Two weeks from today is one of my favorite things that we do. We have a pool party at the Aquatic Center from 6.30 to 8.30. It's just reserved for us. It's a family night. Bring your families and, of course, bring your friends if you want to bring your friends. And we just have a really great time. We rent out the whole place. Um, Pastor Nathan Powell, Pastor Jesse, and myself, we made a really fun video on Facebook. Share that around. Share that to everyone you know, all right? And so it was a great time. We may look a little silly doing some things, but we had a great time with it. So we really hope to see you two weeks from tonight, 630 to 830 at the Aquatic Center. Also... We have a couple other announcements for you as well. We have an, our women's ministry um, has an incredible service opportunity at Beautiful Lives, which is a nonprofit organization that helps women all around the world. Um, if you want to volunteer either on the 24th of July or the 27th, um, you can help organize, hang, steam clean clothes, all those great things just to really help and support them. If you are interested in that, you can sign up at the Welcome Center. Um, you don't have to be a woman to do that. Men and children are also welcome. Welcome as well. If you guys want to do this something as a family, that's a really cool thing that you guys get to be do and be a part of. And we also have a worship night coming up in the first, so yeah, first Sunday of August on the fourth. Um, many of you have been to our pies and hymns kind of event. Um, this is going to be a similar kind of event. Oh well, some of our members, our worship team behind me, are also going to be a part of that. It's just going to be a really great opportunity to come together and worship. And Pastor Nathan Powell will help be, be uh, organizing and leading that. And then finally, Pastor Pat talked about it last. Last week, we are doing a backpack drive for 50 students of our of, of Southside Elementary here in town. And what you do is you grab, grab a backpack, get all, get all the supplies on the school on the list that you can find out at the Welcome Center, and just bring it back by July 29th. And then we'll make sure that they get those to the school. At this time, I'm going to ask that all of you can stand, and we will continue on to worship together. Oh, 
Well, thank you all for being with us today as we worship together. Two quick reminders on your way out. First of all, hope you'll join us next week. Pastor Pat will be back, and we're going to wrap up this series called Love and Light, and he'll be going through the book of 3 John. And finally, today is our annual business meeting, um, so we'd love for you to join us in the chapel about 15 minutes, and we're going to go over the highlights from what God has done here at CCF this year. So grab your kids, and um, uh, hope hope to see you at the annual meeting. And right now, may the uh, grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Also with you. You guys have a great week.